Okay, hello everyone. Uh, to this uh, kind of taster session of a class of mine, uh, I'm Christian uh, Lutzenetz. I teach Tibetan and Buddhist art uh, at SOAS uh, at the Department of for the History of Art and Archaeology. And uh, what I wanted to talk about uh, today is, is what is a mandala? And that particular question uh, concerns a, a course I'm doing on uh, the different interpretations of the mandala over time. And since uh, the term itself is a very popular topic, uh, in kind of more broadly and a very popular term that has uh, gained quite a lot of different meanings over time, and especially a, a kind of modern Western meaning that has reflected back on Asia and so on. I thought this, this is an interesting topic to, to talk about and also to, to explore where it actually comes from and what changed. Uh, I'm not sure if I can uh, chat to everyone, but let me just uh, share what I prepared. So that's just the PowerPoint of the question. And I actually wanted to start. Uh, let me see that I see the chat with a blank uh, page and simply ask you, what do you know or what comes to mind? What is the word that comes to mind uh, when you? Uh, here mandala what how would you describe it with a single word and uh i hope you'll be able to actually send the description in the chat and but i couldn't really find out beforehand if that is possible yes i, I see it's possible yes so please add we have geometry palace a diagram very nice Anything else, other words that come to mind? A doorway, yeah, interesting. Ge geometric configuration image, yes, very good. So rather complex uh, and also kind of, yeah, I, I think that's that's already a good, good way to start. <laughs> uh, and essentially all yeah, spiritual tool. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that all, all the terms that I, I read so far uh, concern essentially the Western interpretation, but the spiritual tool uh, actually con concerns the uh, part of the original meaning. So there is a quite disconnect between that, uh, the figurative meanings at a later time period and uh, the 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 actual uh, original function of the mandala. Uh, so if you actually kind of type the thing into Google, if you type the word mandala into Google, and this I think is a little older, it's not uh, completely up to date, uh, but it what it actually shows you is the most frequent modern Western usage of mandala is in the form of tattoos. Uh, and mandala drawing patterns, yeah, and all of these, you know, uh, look like, or many of these look flower-like and so on, but interspersed within it, we have two uh, famous kind of Buddhist expressions of the mandala. Uh, in the first row, you see the sand mandala, which is probably the most famous version uh, and is today kind of made as a performance as well. And then you have two examples of Tibetan mandalas also displayed in between all these other ones, the mandala color, coloring patterns and books. And so this particular uh, notion, you know, the association with geometry, uh, with a round shape more broadly, that essentially comes from uh, the modern interpretation and accordingly even you know in uh, the oxford dictionary of english simply defines it as a circular figure 
representing the universe in Hindu and Buddhist symbolism. Yeah, and then it gives a second uh, definition. A mandala is a symbol in a tree. Sorry, it should not have gone off. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, So the, the, the second is, is uh, in Jungian psychology, a mandala is a symbol of a dream representing the dreamer's search for completeness and self-unity. And so this is a, essentially a modern psychological interpretation of the mandala. And it is this modern psychological interpretation that of course uh, led to the popularity of the mandala in the West. Well, uh, and it's, predecessor, the predecessor that Jung has actually seen, must have been actually Tibetan mandalas from the 14th century onwards that look somewhat like this. These, this, these are two paintings of one of the, the earliest mandala sets where yeah, you have uh, different uh, essentially architectural palaces with deities inside surrounded by circles, the main function of which is uh, kind of protective in nature, uh, except for the innermost circle, the lotus circle is essentially the ground, the purified ground on which the mandala sits. Why that is important, uh, we can come back to again. The other notion, uh, the association of the mandala with the cosmos uh, is uh, also very strong in the sense uh, or in, in popular imagination, but it derives from one uh, specific mandala that uh, really tries exactly to do that, to essentially liken the mandala and the cosmos to each other. And in this, this uh, form, uh, kind of create a more holistic uh, perspective on the mandala, yeah? And uh, the, in which essentially microcosmos, mandala, and uh, uh, macrocosmos, mandala, and microcosmos, which is the, the, the body of the practitioner align. And this is actually the latest uh, expression of the mandala in esoteric Buddhism, and it dates to about the, the first quarter of the 11th century, that uh, the, the, the teaching of the Kala Chakra mandala came, uh, or, or came to the fore. And this particular mandala then became the foremost uh, mandala uh, in different Tibetan traditions and is the foremost mandala today in terms of its, uh, you know, public uh, ritual uh, presentation, uh, especially, essentially any uh, uh, high teacher of the major Tibetan uh, religious traditions uh, performs uh, the, the Kala Chakra mandala ritual at some stage. So it, that already points out one of the main functions, the mandala is a ritual tool. But uh, A, there are other uh, kind of objects that are associated with the mandala, but may not be exactly the same. In Hinduism, the earlier version actually is called Yantra. And this uh, looks uh, like that on, on the left side. And then the term mandala is more broadly used for, for other kind of grounds with specific meanings, especially when uh, deities are placed within that, as you can see in the Vashtu Purusha mandala on the right side. And so there is a broader meaning within the historic Indian tradition as well about the term mandala. But what I'm specifically talking about is the Buddhist ones, because that's 
the context within which the mandala got uh, first uh, popularized and then you know in in hinduism it was partially kind of taken over and replacing the yantra uh, the earliest examples are interesting insofar as so so they date from the uh, eighth century onwards this is a painting from Dunhuang from the library cave. It's around 10th century. And the peculiarity is that there is no circle on the outside. So the earliest mandalas are actually much more simple. And it's this earlier form that moved uh, to Japan uh, and uh, shows the, the mandala in the Japanese tradition. Yeah, And what you have here is uh, the so-called two world mandalas or twin mandalas. One uh, is the Garbhadhatu, so-called Garbhadhatu, the other is the so-called Vajradhatu mandala. But what is important here is that all of them, a, or maybe that uh, by origin it dates to the ninth century. Uh, and this is, uh, I think, the earliest example from the Sain uh, in the Tochi, and uh, yeah, and, and all the, the mandalas that are uh, shown in these paintings are essentially square on the outside. And so that, that the circular form that we now today uh, identify with the mandala is something that is a later uh, development and we see that development in the earliest Tibetan paintings where for example the protective uh, aspect of the mandala is broken in the sense that the canvas is too small to fit the entire circle within uh, the canvas. Now when in, in principle, you know, the, the mandala is a product of esoteric Buddhism. Esoteric Buddhism is, or tantric Buddhism, as it's more frequently called, is esoteric or secret. Secret in the sense that you need to be initiated into the teaching uh, of, of a particular or practice of a particular deity uh, to to practice that, but, uh, that deity, uh, or to be allowed to practice that deity. And uh, mandalas uh, depict the, these deities and their assemblies. Yeah? The theoretical problem we face is that the teachings themselves are secret. And of course, uh, for that reason, mandalas from the outset weren't necessarily public and weren't necessarily expressed as a form of art. What it instead was done is that uh, maybe the deities were represented. This is an early uh, Kashmiri representation of Chakra Samvara, one of the kind of most important Buddha forms that preside uh, over mandalas. And actually the earliest depictions are often in a peripheral context like Dunhuang, where we have uh, drawings like this that clearly show that the instructional, they teach about how, how to make it, what parts it needs, how the deities are to be depicted and how it is to be colored overall. And so we'll see that there is a, kind of uh, relationship between the actual ritual and then the performance during which a, a mandala is made. And the shape of the mandala is essentially decided uh, through the teacher. Yeah? And the, the, the basic texts of uh, esoteric Buddhism, of course, are the so-called tantras. That's why there is the alternative or an alternative name, tant uh, Tantric Buddhism. Yeah? The Tantras are famous for being uh, rather cryptic to read. 
the information is often expressed in verses. It's often very difficult to, to decipher exactly what is meant with it. And uh, so you can't necessarily uh, draw a mandala on the basis of the Tantra alone. What you need is the, the oral or textual commentary that actually explains the proportions and so on uh, to the one who is supposed uh, to make the mandala proper. And so there is a certain disconnect here. And so what we, we actually see then in the artworks is already kind of an interpretation, a commentary in itself. Uh, And I think what, from what I, I said so far, what you get already is that the mandala is first and foremost a ritual tool. Yeah? It's meant actually, or originally it was meant to simply be a ritual ground, a ground in, into which the uh, deities can be invited. Yeah? And for that purpose, one created a, a kind of square space purified that space, uh, uh, brought different offerings. You'll see here knives taking out the knives and the arrows taking out the, the space and the doors, uh, different offering uh, is placed around. And uh, the little lotus flowers that I inscribed in the different parts of the mandala here uh, the seats of the respective deities. And we'll see symbols drawn in the very center of the mandala. And so this is what I would call a ritual mandala. Another ritual mandala that actually depicts the deities themselves is this one. And this is a fascinating uh, paint, uh, kind of drawing and painting from the Dunhuang Library Cave that shows us also that mandalas originally, and that is uh, kind of characteristic for early esoteric Buddhism, were made for a worldly purpose. Yeah, the purpose was not necessarily to, to, to speed up the spiritual path toward awakening, uh, as it is uh, with, with the later tantric traditions. Often it was, you know, to fend off uh, poison of, of a snake bite and, and things like this. And this particular painting, it also concerns a healing ritual. And so the deities were here invited uh, to ward off the demon that we see in the, in the uh, lower left corner here that has this kind of stakes in his limbs and obviously is considered as having made the person that lies on the mat uh, sick. And so it's it's a healing ritual that we have represented here. And for that healing ritual, a ritual mandala was uh, made. And we have that depicted above it with the deities. Yeah. This ritual mandala is also displayed in later temples. Here we have a late 12th century version with a simple ritual mandala. It's still in the square and uh, with lotus flowers for the seeds of deities. And of course, the ritual function of the mandala is also the, the basis for the so-called sand mandala. Yeah? The sand mandala is nothing else than another kind of temporarily made uh, mandala, usually for special rituals which serve the initiation uh, the introduction of new disciples to that teaching, to that deity that presides the mandala. Yeah? In this case, what we see is a mandala of the Bodhisattva Manjushri, who is the Bodhisattva of wisdom. So he is surrounded by four books, uh, uh, book piles, <laughs> uh, and in the mandala proper. And this, this was just kind of made during a week uh, at the conference in Atlanta, I think in 2008. And of course, you know, it takes a, an entire week to create uh, the mandala out of sand. Uh, so it's, it's a big effort. Then 
the deity is, is invited into the mandala proper, then the disciples are in, invited uh, to the deity uh, by essentially, you know, seeing the mandala, but then also visualizing uh, the, the deity uh, in prescribed manners that may change from practice to practice uh, slightly. And at the very end of the ritual, the mandala is destroyed. <laughs> And uh, now, since the, the, the deity has resided in it, uh, of course, before it's destroyed, the deity is, is essentially disinvited. Uh, and now, since it has resided in it, uh, the Zen itself is uh, considered sacred, so it is collected. Sometimes it's given to, or some parts of it are given to practitioners, and some other parts are disposed in the river. And so the sand mandala, as we have it here in this representation, in the full representation, reflects the ritual function still, but it is both a ritual mandala and what I call a representational mandala, meaning the representation of the mandala itself with its deities, the palace, and, and all its uh, integral parts. And this is where, where these kind of two areas come together. Now, if we'll try to find out about the history of, of uh, this particular practice and esoteric Buddhism more broadly, uh, in the earliest forms, of course, we don't have the ritual mandalas. But what we have is the deities that may associate it may be associated with mandala teachings. I don't go into great detail, but for example, one can associate uh, this particular triad of a Buddha flanked by the Bodhisattvas Avalokiteshvara and uh, Vajrapani with particular esoteric Buddhist texts. And uh, in some of them, also an expanded configuration with eight bodhisattvas is described. And this would essentially be uh, the earliest mandala representation in India that is uh, in Elora at cave 12. And of course, what is represented here is not the mandala itself, but it's the assembly of deities that occupy the mandala. And of course, if you have questions in between, if I'm not clear, uh, just write the, uh, into the chat. Uh, I'll, I'll monitor the chat on the way. Yeah, I don't want to make it uh, too complex, but eventually, uh, you know, uh, the concept of uh, five uh, esoteric Buddhas uh, developed in the eighth century in which uh, five different Buddhas ascribed to the cardinal directions in the center with Vairojana in the center. And that goes back to a particular Tantra that is called the Sarva Tathagata Tattva Sangraha Tantra, the Tantra of the reality of all Tathagatas, which is another name for Buddha. And that is, for example, the base for the Japanese version of the mandala that we have seen uh, before. It is also the continuation of a longer tradition of locating different Buddhas in different directions. In a, a recently published book by Kimiaki Danaka, an illustrated history of the mandala, actually has this uh, nice diagram that shows how you know, these in different uh, Buddhist sources, textual sources, the Buddhas are ascribed to different directions and how the concept of the five Buddhas develops, but also the variations within it. Obviously to go into those var variations would be too much. And for that, I have this kind of separate class uh, that just talks about the different assemblies and their relationship. And so uh, this stupa, for example, represents uh, the four Buddhas that surround the central one. 
each of them has a distinctive gesture and a, a distinctive attribute, for example. And uh, this, the stupa itself then represents the main Buddha. Yeah. This would not uh, be a mandala per se, but we, it kind of uh, develops out of that concept of the five Buddhas. And so it's part of, of an esoteric Buddhist imagery. Now, if we think about early mandalas, they are very useful because they, they, they give us an idea or, or, or an insight into how, you know, we have to read the very complex image of, of the mandala and how we have to understand the different parts that uh, were brought together within it. And it's very clear that from an early stage onwards, they, or there, is, there has been a kind of distinction between uh, what one would call the, the habitation, the mandala palace and the inhabitants. Yeah, before we looked at the inhabitants that occupy the mandala, like the five Buddhas or the eight Bodhisattvas. Yeah? The habitation itself is, of course, originally the, the, the ritual ground. Yeah? And on some uh, representations, we have uh, that rit ritual ground represented often with the four doors in the cardinal direction, a central uh, circular element, and uh, yeah, sometimes, you know, guardians in the doors as in this particular one. And so out of that uh, ritual ground, a more complex notion of the Mandala Palace uh, develops. Uh, and that notion of the Mandala Palace, of course, derives from Indra's palace on Mount Meru. So the god Indra, the highest god uh, in kind of traditional cosmology uh, of India, would, uh, and, and the head of the, the kind of 33 gods, uh, he would have the special palace made by Vishwakarman, who is the, the divine artisan, so to speak. Uh, and, and, and that palace forms kind of the model for the palace representation. But we have seen early palaces are very simple. The walls are just drawn. The, the gates are just openings. Sometimes uh, they become a little bit more complex. The gates become kind of T-shaped. But in later uh, Mandala palaces, they, they are very elaborate. Yeah, and they are kind of a fascinating combination of uh, parts uh, of the architecture that can be seen from bird's eye view and parts of the architecture that can be seen from the side view. Yeah, so for example, if we look at this particular one, which is a, a mandala of a form of Chaka Samvara, again, we have the walls, which uh, would be seen from the top, but then we have the garlands along the walls, uh, which would be hanging from the top of uh, the wall as they do in this particular three-dimensional model. Yeah, And so mandalas are essentially two-dimensional representations. Once the palace is there, two-dimensional representations of uh, three-dimensional structures. And these three-dimensional structures can are distinct uh, depending on the, the Tantra and the different interpretations of the Tantra and the main deity. Yeah? And this is why mandalas in, in the Buddhist context already have quite a diverse uh, appearance. Yeah? So this would be... Uh, one model of a, a kind of stupa shaped uh, mandala. This is another mandala that is today in the Bodala Palace, uh, and it's a three dimensional Kala Chakra mandala. So, the most complex of the mandalas with its 
distinctive gates that have these nine compartments within it. But also in the three-dimensional form, as it is represented here, yeah, it's, it's the space, it's still a, potentially a ritual space into which the deities can be invited, but then it's permanent. Yeah, once you have a permanent uh, representation of, of the, the mandala itself, uh, then you can invite uh, the deity to abide in the palace uh, forever. Uh, and it means quite literally forever because in the so-called uh, consecration ritual that is performed for that uh, purpose, the deity is asked to abide there for, forever. It, that means as long as uh, samsara lasts, so as long as the cycle of rebirth lasts. Any questions so far? <laughs> that may be a lot to take in, but obviously you'll see that there's quite a difference between, you know, the more vague modern association of the mandala and the historic uh, Buddhist associations that essentially influenced uh, the modern uh, interpretation. Yeah, if there are no questions specifically, you can always write them in the chat. Uh, I, I point out a few more uh, things about the mandala that are then interesting. Uh, we haven't uh, talked about the, the, the term mandala itself yet. Yeah, mandala means in a way circle. It's a Sanskrit word. It's not entirely clear uh, what it derives from. There are different interpretations, but it's clear that it's used for something that is either circular or something that surrounds or is surrounded by. Yeah, the Tibetan translation then calls it Ginkor or Gilkor, and that kind of has both elements, the center and the surrounding in the term itself. So this is why for the definition of the mandala, the circular element is important. And this is why in the, the, the the Google page that we have seen at the very beginning, uh, this kind of circular element is, is predominant in the presentation. But we have seen that historically mandalas haven't been circular. Yeah, They have just been uh, square ritual grounds like on this uh, representation. Then of course is the question what the circle is. And I guess you, you can actually guess the answer now. <laughs> what is the circle of the mandala then? Anybody wants to guess, write the guess in the chat? No? Well, we have seen some hints already uh, with different versions of the mandala represented. I think here I go too far. Let me see. Repetition. Okay. So the circle is then the central circle. Yeah. And that's, of course, what would align with all these early representations, like this one or the Japanese one. So it really refers to the central circular arrangement. That central circular arrangement is, of course, then also found in uh, the rituals, yeah, in the ritual mandala representations. And depending if the central circle is a lotus, then it's a, a kind of more peaceful deity that is uh, and, and the more peaceful purpose uh, of the ritual itself. And if it's a blade that flames, it's more wrathful and it's a more, uh, you know, aggressive uh, ritual that the purpose is of. And accordingly, the different shapes of the interior of the circle uh, define 
different purposes for the rituals. Yeah, and so traditionally one differentiates this uh, four main rituals: pacifying, enriching, subjugating, and destroying. So, so some uh, and the destroying ones would be uh, those with associated with flaming blades and uh, uh, kind of elements like that. Uh, and another indication that the central circle that uh, kind of in, encompasses the core deities is the actual mandala is uh, shown by a unique form of the mandala that uh, was popular in, in northeastern India uh, for a short period of time, namely the so-called lotus mandala. Yeah, here we have only the central circle. In this case, it's a piece that you can see in the British Museum. It has Shakyamuni uh, in the center, surrounded by the eight bodhisattvas. So it's exactly the same uh, configuration as this one. But here we have only the assembly of deities. And here, we have uh, again only the assembly of deities, but we also have a habitation, but the habitation is the lotus itself. Yeah, we have seen earlier mandalas sit on lotuses. In this case, just the central circle, lotus circle of the mandala is represented. And uh, these lotus mandalas are peculiar insofar as you can essentially collapse uh, the blades together that they form a closed lotus band. And so you can either close the mandala or open it up again. Yeah. And of course, you would open it up when you perform a ritual and you would close it when uh, the, the, the ritual is essentially inactive. Yeah. And other evidence for the importance of the central circle are representation in, in Dunhuang, like this one where the, the, yeah, only the central circle of the mandala is emphasized. Which of course begs the question, when does the mandala become circular on the outside? And I think that has a lot to do with the, the, the prominence that the so-called Kala Chakra mandala gets in the tradition by the late 10th, early 11th century. And uh, that particular mandala is associated with, uh, you know, the, the macrocosmos, so to speak. And uh, the macrocosmos is uh, built of different increasingly dense uh, elements from an ether element at the bottom to an earth element or earth disk at the top. These elements are circular. On them sit sits the cosmic ocean with the continents, among which Jambudvipa is the Indian continent, uh, but it's this outer circular element yeah, that are represented in the color chakra mandala as rings surrounding the central palace. Yeah? And uh, which means because these uh, elements are imagined as disks, and even in the earlier version of the Buddhist cosmos, uh, they would be round, uh, more cylinders than, you know, increasingly expansive disks. Uh, if you want to represent them and include them in the mandala, you have to make it round on the outside. And so obviously this was uh, very successful and eventually all mandalas were represented round. Uh, for the specific Kala Chakra mandala, there is also another form that uh, kind of re-emphasizes uh, this uh, very round shape uh, by even making the mandala palace itself uh, round. And in this case, even given, giving it kind of eight doors. Yeah, and so this would be one peculiar uh, form of the Kala Chakra Mandala.
Yeah, and, and the color chakra mandala itself, of course, becomes uh, prominent then with, uh, you know, at the time in the 11th century when different tantric traditions, esoteric Buddhist traditions that involved mandalas were uh, kind of translated and transmitted uh, to Tibet. And Indian teachers were asked uh, to summarize the teachings around them. And one such Indian teacher was Abhay Karagupta, who created a trilogy of works that is only about mandalas. Yeah? Uh, the Vajravali uh, describes the mandalas, the Nishpana Yoga Vali uh, describes the deities, and the, the Chyoti Manjari, the rituals that are associated with it. And uh, yeah, and, and, but, but these texts like that eventually lead to a, a more uniform appearances of, of mandalas overall. And so they take on different elements uh, from, from each other and become kind of more uniform over time. And that's why later mandalas then look more similar to each other than the earlier mandalas that we have. I see there is a question in the chat. Is there a difference in the purpose of the Jain Kala Chakra in a Buddhist Kala Chakra mandala? Uh, I must say, I don't know the Jain, uh, Jain Kala Chakra uh, well enough to actually answer that. But uh, the, in terms of the Buddhist uh, Kala Chakra Mandala, the main purpose is really a kind of unification of the di different tantric systems and bringing together the different uh, symbolic uh, connotations and uh, practice elements uh, of what the practitioner does into a kind of unified system yeah so that's quite characteristic i'm not familiar with the jain kala chakra i would have to check that <laughs> but it, i i would assume it's a kind of a later development of that or, or a distinct development of that yeah i'm sorry that i'm not answering your question here uh, properly and so, so with the, uh, yeah, there is another one, is the relationship between the quality of the mandala and the disciples' experience and interaction with the deity. Uh, yes, uh, because there is essentially a, a difference. So, so I, I mentioned that in early esoteric Buddhism, or early esoteric Buddhist practices were often more for worldly gains. Yeah, those are much simpler in terms of, of the, the, the mandalas that are represented, but they also dif differ in the association with the deities themselves. So, for example, uh, yeah, if, if you want to cure snake bite, you call up uh, Mahamayuri, uh, who is the, the, the uh, peacock goddess, so to speak, with a peacock feather. And of course, the peacock, peacock is the enemy of the snake. And her qualities are supposed to work against uh, that snake bite. Yeah? So this is quite a different practice from a practice in later esoteric Buddhism. Like here we have Guya uh, Samaja Manju Vajra Mandala, uh, in which you essentially, you have to imagine the more esoteric Buddhism becomes, the more symbolic the deities become, and the more they uh, represent different qualities through their different heads, attributes, colors, and so on. And so in, in this later practice, what one does is one actually imagines the deity either in front of oneself, yeah, or one imagines oneself as the deity. In other words, one takes the, the, the symbolic qualities that I ascribed to the deity on 
And this is why, uh, you know, the Isidere Buddhist tradition is thought to be so effective because it brings you closer to the Buddha faster, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and accelerates uh, that path, so to speak. Yeah. I hope that answers uh, the question. So, so there are quite different forms of interaction. The mandalas itself then is used for the, the initiation of the disciple. But then once that has, uh, once somebody is initiated, he would practice the deity himself. Uh, and he would visualize the mandala but in a slightly different three-dimensional form that is kind of reduced to the basic elements. Yeah. So for example, here we'll have uh, in the mandala itself, we have the fire circle, the vajra circle. These are still imagined as is imagined, you know, a lotus ground out of which something emerges and it's usually the seed syllable of the deity and out of that uh, one visualizes the deity within a three-dimensional uh, cage or tent uh, that the deity abides in. So, so this ritual dimension is, is that we have in the ritual ground of the mandala is kind of converted into a third dimension. Uh, when you actually uh, practice it. I hope that I answered that. <laughs> yeah, and, and so I think what's important that in the Buddhist context, the mandala is really kind of purpose oriented and it's a temporal kind of means uh, to help uh, the practitioner, yeah, to progress in his spiritual path. And uh, one of the, the so-called dohas, the, the songs of uh, one of the Mahasiddhas, who of, of course are credited with many of the, the teachings surrounding mandalas, uh, brings it very nicely when taking up or when taking things up as the object of the mind, even the unagitated Lord is brought down. The circle of the mandala brings holy to ruin the Buddhas, the world, all the goddesses and wrathful protectors. And so what that indicates to us is once you are spiritually awakened, you don't need the mandala anymore. You also don't need the Buddhas <laughs> the, 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 and all the deities that, that surround them anymore because you have already kind of uh, attained the same level. And so that's the kind of main purpose of the mandala. There's another uh, question. In Buddhist religion, this used to be one object called mandal, which used to be placed before the deity. Yes, uh, that's a very good question. The, the so-called, it, it is the same term, it's essentially also called mandala or mandal, as you say. Uh, I don't think I have an example in the PowerPoint here. Not really, but it looks a little bit like uh, this uh, cosmos representation. It often has different rings that get smaller towards the top. Sometimes it's also uh, just one disc with a little palace on Mount Meru. And so what that is, is actually the offering of the universe. That means an offering of a depiction of the cosmos. Yeah. And that is often called a mandala offering. And so it's different from the actual ritual mandalas, but it kind of comes together with them uh, with the color chakra mandala. Uh, and of course, the, the idea for that is, you know, uh, dana giving uh, plays a big role in, in uh, Buddhism. 
both in terms of you know financially but then also kind of spiritually in the sense of giving one's body or giving one's or the the entire surrounding and so the the offering of the universe uh, it would be exactly that and so this must have been what you have seen <laughs> would be interesting to hear how it looked like <laughs> So, uh, any other question? I think uh, we can stop here. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed it. Obviously, it's a complex topic. It takes a long time <laughs> to get familiar with it. And each uh, Tantra has its own mandala and its own ideas around it. But as you got all, uh, through the lecture, I think, is that over time, uh, they become slightly more similar to each other and assimilated, partly because, you know, the commentator is familiar with, with more different ones and aligns them with each other. And so, and of course, uh, the West then takes these different elements of the, the Buddhist mandalas, but then also uh, Hindu versions of it, uh, maybe chain versions of it. I haven't looked at those uh, in any detail, and uh, brings them together in a kind of more more holistic and uh, psychologically integrated form. But originally, they weren't really used in that way. <laughs> so I hope you you got an idea what, uh, yeah, the at, at least. Uh, some idea what the mandala originally was used for, and that is quite different from its today's usage in a coloring book. But the coloring book also has its derivations. Yeah, theoretically, you could also, you know, replicate one of these uh, Tibetan mandalas as a coloring um, exercise. And I'm sure it's uh, very contemplative and soothing as well. So thanks, uh, and thanks for your interest here. I stop sharing. So if there are no other questions, I'll wish you a good day. Yeah, and uh, I hope to see some of you at SOAS in the next year. <laughs>